Hello everyone, welcome to ECE 3500. Today we're going to talk about lecture 15. Okay, very good. So let's do a very brief review of our previous lecture. So in our last lecture, we <coughs> finished talking about the Fourier series. And uh, in particular, we talk about the property of the Fourier series, right? And from now on, if we mention the Fourier series, basically, we mean the complex exponential form of the Fourier series, right? Uh, <clears throat> and we do not care too much about the sine and the cosine form of the Fourier series, right? And uh, so let's see. So here is a, a reminder of the definition of the Fourier series. So this is basically the definition of the Fourier series, right? And uh, so we can understand the Fourier series as a transform pair, right? And this is a forward transform. So where we could get uh, uh, the fre frequency domain signal C of K uh, by using X of T. Right, and uh, this is the backward transformation where we could use the frequency domain signal C of K to get back our X of T, right? So, and uh, in today's lecture, you're gonna see that so we, ca we can derive the Fourier transform exactly from these two equations, okay? All right, so here are all the properties that we covered for the Fourier series. In our previous lecture, we talked about them in a very very detailed way right the reason we do that is so <clears throat> in all the uh, in, in the properties of all the transforms they are very very similar right so we can use almost identical idea to prove all of them right that's why we want to cover this property uh, in a very uh, slow way and uh, and also this is not the first time we see all of those properties right and here one important assumption is that we assume both uh, x of t and y of t has uh, have the exact same uh, omega naught, which is a fundamental frequency, right? And we assume that the Fourier series of x of t is ck, and the Fourier series of y t is dk, right? So in this case, so the first property we covered is called the linearity property. So in this property, so what we can do is that if we do a scaled sum of x, x t and y of t and then we do the exact same thing in the frequency domain right so everything on the left hand side is the time domain and everything on the uh, right hand side uh, is the frequency domain okay and if x of t and y of t can do not have the same omega naught we cannot use this property, right? We need to be very, very careful here. Okay, the second property is called uh, the time shifting property. So in this property, if we shift uh, the time domain signal by amount of tau on the right, and then, so in the frequency domain, we need to use the frequency domain signal CK multiply e to the power of negative j omega naught k tau, okay? So now if there's a negative tau here and then on the face part, we also shift this by a negative tau basically. Negative tau multiply k omega naught, of course, right? Okay, and, uh, and uh, so this is a very, very interesting and important property. It basically means that if we, sh in the time domain, we shift by amount of tau, then in the frequency domain, so what we're going to have is the phase shift by the same amount of tau multiply omega naught k. Okay, so this means that in one domain, if it's a shift, and then in the other domain, it is always a phase shift, right? The same thing holds here for the frequency shifting property, right? So if we shift on K, uh, CK by amount of M, so this means that we shift this signal by M multiply omega naught uh, in the frequency domain, right? And uh, if we have a frequency domain shifting, and then in the time domain, we're gonna have a phase shift again. Okay, so again, you know, if we in one domain is a whatever shift, then in the other domain, it's always a phase shift, right? This holds true, and we prove that in in detail in the class. And the next one is called conjugation. So if we do a conjugate in the time domain signal, and then 
we do a negative k here and then conjugate of the frequency domain signal right it's a negative uh, on k and then conjugate the next one is called time sh uh, reversal property so if we do a time reversal on the time domain signal and then we do a frequency reversal on the frequency domain signal okay so the next one is interesting the next one is called the periodic or circular convolution property right so we didn't cover this um, circular convolution uh, now so we're going to see that later in this class but the definition is very simple right because both of the x of t and the y of t are periodic functions so we cannot do the regular convolution where the integral is from negative infinity to plus infinity right we cannot do that because that will not exist instead so what we can do is called circular convolution right we just do this integral over one period so this period could be anything okay and if we do a circular convolution in a time domain then in the frequency domain what we do is a multiplication right so this means that you know the so this can simplify our computation a lot right because we know the convolution is not easy to compute right so if we transfer both signal into the frequency domain signal and then do a multiplication and then we can transfer that back right so in this way we could get so in this way we could get um, uh, a multiplication in the frequency domain right very good and uh, and uh, similarly so if we do a multiplication in the time domain and then in the frequency domain it's a convolution right so basically so both of them means that if we in one domain is a convolution and then in the other domain it is a multiplication okay very good and uh, the next property is the differentiation property and also the you know these two are the differentiation and the integration right and uh, so again so that can help us to simplify uh, the Fourier series can help us to simplify the computation a lot so if we do a derivative in the time domain and then in the frequency domain so what we are going to have is nothing but we used we multiply a jk omega naught multiply the Fourier coefficient here right so sh here should be ck so uh, so i will correct it later and uh, for the integral we need to be a little bit more careful right so in the so so we can see for the derivative it's a multiplication of j omega naught jk omega naught right on the Fourier uh, series so if we do an integral so we just use the Fourier series divided by jk omega naught okay it's the opposite uh, opposite operation but here we need to be careful that this op this property holds only if c naught is zero right because we do not want k equal to be zero okay very good so the next three are the special property when xt is real okay so if xt is a real signal and then c of k will just equal to c negative k conjugate okay and if k is if xt is real and even then ck is real and even and uh, on the other hand if xt is real and odd then c of k is purely imaginary so there's no real part and odd okay so the next uh, property is a very very important property it's called Parseval's theorem right so this basically means that so if we want to compute the power of x of t in the time domain right the physical meaning of this computation is basically to compute the power of x of t right and t is any period so so in order to compute that so what we can do is actually that we compute this summation right we just need to take the absolute value of ck and then do a square and then sum this over k okay you can understand this as the energy in the frequency domain right because that is the definition of the energy for ck however the physical meaning of this is the uh, is the power in the time domain right the, the meaning doesn't change right okay and in the 
in the in the in the lecture. So we give an example to show you that actually this can be much easier compared to this, right? And the proof of here is uh, is here. So the proof is a very uh, typical proof. I'll suggest you you know to just uh, remember remember this proof. Okay, very good. All right. So this is the review of our previous lecture. Okay. Moreover, I also uploaded to our course website the table of forest series, right? Like this. So basically, from the table, you can see all the properties of the forest series, right? And here's the definition of the forest series, and. Uh, and here are all the properties, right? So you can check all the properties here. All right. Okay. And also in this table, it includes all the continuous time transform and the transform and its proper corresponding properties here, right? And also including the specific uh, function definition that we're going to use later in this class. Okay. So yeah, please feel free to use this table later on. Okay. Good. So in this lecture, we're gonna start talking about the next very important topic, which is the continuous time Fourier transform, right? I'm sure that you have heard of Fourier transform from your previous class, right? But now let's see how we can obtain the continuous time. Fourier transform. Okay, well, this is called CTFT. CTFT. Okay, so now let's get started. All right. Okay, so we know that for the Fourier series, so that is for the continuous time and the periodic signal, right? Let's say for the continuous time for a series so let's consider x let's denote this time this signal as xt hat right so we have to make sure that this guy is of course continuous time and uh, periodic right so we know that in practice, we know periodic signal may not be uh, practical, right? So in practice, so we may want to, you know, analyze the continuous time a periodic signal, right? And you may see that by doing that, by using the forest series, we can simplify our computation a lot, right? For example, so instead of doing a convolution, we could do a multiplication in the frequency domain or vice versa, right? So when we want to do the derivative, so we don't need to do the derivative, right? Or the integral, okay? So we can do the multiplication and the division by a constant in the other domain, right? So those, and also including, we could use Parseval's uh, relationship to compute the power of the signal, right? So those properties are very handy in terms of computation, right? So, so now we ask ourselves that would that be possible that we could develop something very similar to the continuous time a periodic signal, right? So that's basically our goal here, okay? And normally when we consider the periodic signal, so that should be a power signal, right? Okay, so now, so let's consider continuous time, let's consider, let's say, x of t, okay, which is a continuous time, aperiodic, and energy signal. Okay, so 
is that possible that we could have something similar to the forest series right so now let's see how can we consider this problem right so so far the forest series was developed very well for the continuous time periodic signal right so now it will be great that we can use the forest series to help us to develop something that is for the aperiodic signal okay so this comes to the idea we mentioned earlier right so which is that so is there uh, a relationship between the periodic signal and the aperiodic signal right the answer is yes right so now since we know the forest series for the periodic signal so let's see how can we uh, transfer a periodic signal to a aperiodic signal right that is what we're going to do now okay so yeah let's see how can we do that so basically we cover this idea more or less before when we talk about the periodic signal right the idea is as follows so now let's see we have a periodic signal uh, maybe just for simplicity right let's say how about we have something like this right that, let's say here is our xt tilde right and uh, we have a periodic signal like that okay and let's say clearly here is our t naught over 2 here's our negative t naught over 2 here's d right so this is a periodic signal right let's say now this is not what we want right so what we do want is something like this let's say we just want one period of it let's say this is what we want yeah for simplicity that for simplicity that let's just assume here's one here's one so this is what we want right right so what is the relationship between this guy and this guy or how can we get this guy from here okay so one way to get this is as follows so how about now we enlarge the period of this guy right so which means the follows so how about we do something like this okay so let's say this is you know the signal within one period right so how about we move the second second one to something further okay so now this so this would be our new period t naught prime okay so we have a bigger period now right but you know we still have a relation between this guy and this guy right so from here to here we just enlarge the period nothing more than that okay so next step we want to make sure this period is even larger right therefore it means that so we can basically let t naught prime goes to infinity and then so if the distance between here and here is infinitely large then it basically means that we have a aperiodic signal right because the signal still repeat itself however you know the distance of the repeating is infinite remember in the definition of the periodic signal we always need the period to be a finite number right so if the period is infinite number and then it basically means that the signal is not periodic anymore okay so that's basically how we could get a signal a pure a, a periodic signal from a periodic signal okay and you can see that you know in terms of the, the analysis we can keep t naught as a constant right doesn't change but then we can basically let t naught go to infinity and then we could get the transform for the aperiodic signal right that's the basic idea of how can we get the Fourier transform for the aperiodic for the continuous time aperiodic signal
right? So let, now let's realize this idea. So basically our idea is, is, is not that hard. So our idea is like this. So we just let the period or the fundamental period of the periodic signal goes to infinity and then xt hat will goes to xt right so which is shown by this figure basically right okay so now let's see how we can derive it right again so here so what uh, so this is not a extremely rigorous de uh, derivation right you can think this is kind of like intuitive derivation okay so it's, it's not very hard to understand but it's not super rigorous okay so now let's write down the forest series of x of t tilde right so remember x tilde t so it's defined here so that is the continuous time periodic signal all right okay so we can write x tilde t as a summation of all the ck's right where ck is basically the Fourier series j k omega, omega t okay and vice versa so ck equals to what the 1 over t naught we do the integral and uh, x tilde t e negative j e negative j k omega naught dt right so that's the definition so now let's do some manipulation you know to make x of t tilde becomes a periodic signal right so now let's, let's see how we can do that all right so let's repeat this equation okay but now let's replace c of k by this guy right this is what we always do in when we prove the properties of the forest series right so let's do this okay so inside we have this x tilde t e negative j k omega naught t dt and outside we have e negative j k omega naught uh, positive e j k omega naught t okay so next let's see what we do okay so given this so the next step is that so let's write let's use the fact that uh, omega naught equals to 2 pi over t naught and uh, replace this 1 over t naught by omega naught okay so 1 over t naught is nothing but omega naught over 2 pi okay so again without loss of generality let's write the integral limit from 1 over t naught till t naught what i mean negative t naught over 2 to t naught over 2 all right and inside uh yeah so here you know we may want to use some different letter here right because we have a t here so this t is for the is the dummy variable for the integral so let's replace this t by tau okay so inside we're gonna have x tau e negative j k omega naught tau d tau and e j k omega naught t okay so this is what we have very good so now we're going to use some different notation again so now let's let omega naught equals to delta omega right just you know replace uh, replace the variable right so you may guess right so delta omega basically means that something really small okay so later on we're gonna get let delta omega becomes a very small in fact so it'll become the infinitesimal uh, 
value of omega, right? Okay, so now, and after, you know, making this change, so we can uh, basically take uh, the delta omega out of the equation, right? So let's write this down. I have one over uh, two pi, and then, so we're gonna write delta omega here, okay? On the inside again, it is this guy, okay? x tilde tau e negative j k delta omega tau d tau and then here is e j k delta omega t okay very good okay so and let's see the next step here so the first we can take this one over two pi out right Okay, very good. And then, so what we're going to do is to let t naught becomes infinity, right? Like, you know, what we said before. So let t naught, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, let's write a, a line here to make that explicit. So what we're going to do now is to let the t naught becomes very large. Right, so when t naught becomes very, very large, so we know the fact that the delta omega is nothing but two pi over t naught. Right, remember delta omega is our omega naught, right? And then the delta omega will becomes very small as t naught goes to infinity. Actually, we can write this will goes to let's say t naught goes to infinity, and this guy will becomes d omega, which is the infinitesimal uh, of omega right it's very small okay very good and uh, and uh, given this so we can see when the delta omega becomes d omega right then what is k multiplied delta omega right so if o delta omega is the d omega which is very small right so if this guy becomes k d omega right so it will make this guy to be a continuous number right because when delta omega goes to zero becomes very small then k times d omega can be equal to any value because k is from negative infinity to plus infinity all right it basically means that the d a k d omega will becomes omega right it can take any value Right. So given all of this, let's see what this will be equals to. Okay. And uh, so let's take the one over two pi out. And uh, so first of all, let's see. So what this summation will become, right? So we didn't mention that. So let's uh, yeah, let's mention this here, right? So the summation. So given all of this fact, right? So the summation actually will become, right? If we do, if we sum each of them, each of this guy, multiply delta omega, but the delta, delta omega is d omega now. It's an infi infinitesimal, okay? Then it means that summation is equivalent will become the integral, okay? This summation will become the integral, okay? integral of d omega okay if the summation is something delta omega so it will become an integral of d omega okay so, so given all of this so this guy will becomes 1 over 2 pi so we do the integral so this is over omega right let's say from negative infinity to plus infinity right and we have another integral inside so remember so t naught also goes to infinity right so it means that we have another integral goes to from negative infinity to plus infinity and inside so if we let all of this happen right the t naught goes to infinity 
So it basically means that this guy, yeah, let's also write it here. So if we let t not go to infinity, so the x hat of tau will become x tau, right? The, the reason of this is basically this, right? When t goes in, t not goes to infinity, so we're gonna have a a periodic signal, right? Also, we we have written this here, okay? So inside, instead of x tilde, we have x tau now, okay? And then e negative j, and uh, as we said before, k times delta omega becomes a continuous variable omega now, and the tau, d tau, okay? And then outside, we have e, j, so k times delta omega becomes omega, t, and d omega. Okay, so this is what we got now. So, yeah, let's repeat this in the next page, okay, to make it a little bit more clear. So now what we're going to have, what we have now is x of t, the aperiodic signal. So that equals to, so 1 over 2 pi, we have double integral here, 1 outside, 1 inside. Okay, e j omega t d omega, right? This is what we got now. Okay, and you can see that so this guy plays the exact same role as the forest series as before, right? Let's see. So for the forest series, uh, this is what we got, right? So the signal equals to a summation of c k multiply this guy, but now we have something very similar right so we have this so this is the row of the ck and then multiply a complex exponential and then we do the integral right before we do the summation okay very good so now the only difference here is what right is now we so this is a function of omega right before it's a function of k because ck has only the discrete so it's a discrete function discrete signal right but now we have something different so this is a continuous signal which is a which is a function of omega now right so instead of ck so we can write this as what as a function of omega so we can write this as a capital x of omega okay and uh, now we can see that so at the, we define x omega, where you know we derive it right. Although it's not extremely rigorous, but you can see this ha is happening. X tau e. So, so x omega equals to this integral, right? And we define this guy. So this is called the continuous time. Fourier transform or the CTFT. Okay, and uh, again, so we can by using this x omega, we can get our xt back, right? The inverse transform is 1 over 2 pi, remember that, and uh, we have this. Okay, so this is the transform pair. Okay, so we can write xt, use this double arrow as a CTFT, and capital X omega. Okay, and uh, you can find that, so this relationship is almost identical as what we got for the continuous time uh, periodic function or for the forest series, right? Again, let's recall this. Let me see whether I still have this or not. Yeah, we can just see that, right? So in order to get x omega, so we just do the original variable, multiply a complex exponential, and then we do the derivative, we do the integral over this variable. So if we look at ck here, 
right? It is almost identical, right? So we have our continuous time signal, and then we multiply this by a complex exponential and then do the integral. And of course, since xt is periodic function, and then we do this integral over one period, right? But now we can do this over from negative infinity to, to plus infinity, okay? And in order to get our xt back, so what do we do is that we use the transform the signal, multiply e to the power of plus j omega t, and then do the integral. On the other hand, we use this, the transform signal, multiply e to the power of plus j k omega naught t, and then do the summation, right? They're almost identical, right? The only difference here is that we need to be careful about there's a constant here, okay? Hopefully, so now, you know, you can see the relationship between the Fourier series and the Fourier transform, right? It turns out that we can derive the Fourier transform from the Fourier series, okay? And uh, get this. Okay, very good. And uh, of clearly, so this guy is called the inverse Fourier transform. And of course, we can call this the inverse continuous time uh, Fourier transform, okay? And then normally, you know, since we are given x of t, right? So we can replace, you know, this back to t, right? Doesn't matter, but, you know, that may just look better, right? So we have x t equals to this guy and x omega equals to this, okay? Very good. So this is the Fourier transform. And... Uh, so let's unprocess, unprocess this back again, right? So when we mention the Fourier transform, so this is for the uh, continuous time aperiodic signal, right? So for the Fourier series, continuous time periodic, but for the continuous time Fourier transform, it's for the aperiodic and the continuous time. Okay, so just you know, be careful, right? They are not overlapping, right? So, so far, let's assume that. So the Fourier transform is only for continuous time aperiodic, and the Fourier series is only for continuous time periodic, right? So later on, you know, uh, you know, you may see that, you know, in practice, so we, we almost never use the Fourier series. Right, so you should heard of the Fourier transform many many times, but you know in practice you may never heard of Fourier series. Why is that? Okay, so it turns out later that so by by introducing by the introduction of the special signal like the complex exponential and delta function, so we can actually do the Fourier transform for periodic signal, right? But we're gonna see that later. Okay, but now let's keep this understanding, right? So we're going this from the historic point of view, right? So we start from the continuous time periodic signal and we can get for a series. And then we think, okay, so what if I want to get the same kind of analysis, the same kind of the frequency domain and the analysis for the aperiodic signal? Would that be possible? It turns out that yes, it is possible, right? By using the relationship between the periodic signal and the, the aperiodic signal, and then we could get the Fourier transform for aperiodic continuous time signal, right? So this is the logic we're following at this moment. Good. So now let's let's study a few examples, okay? Okay. So the first example we want to see is. It's a very simple example. Let's consider the case where x t equals to delta t. Okay, so now let's compute um, what is its Fourier transform x omega. Okay, so this basically equals to nothing, but let's use the definition. So x t, right? So let's recall this. So it's xt multiply e negative j omega t dt, right? E negative j omega t dt. Okay, so that equals to 
x t equals to delta t e negative j omega t dt. Very good. Okay, so now how do we do this? Okay, so you may you may remember the again sampling property of the delta uh, direct delta function, right? So this basically, you know, if any function multiply to a delta function, basically it equals to the function itself, but evaluate at uh, at time zero, right? So this will equals to again e negative j omega times zero dt. Okay, and clearly this guy is one, and then this is what going what we're going to get. Okay, so then what is this integral? Right, it's very clear, right? So that is basically the definition of the delta function. So that will be one. Okay. So now let's see what's the meaning of this, right? So we can comfortably write x delta t and uh, the Fourier transform pair is basically one. Right. Let's draw this. So here is our delta t, and here's t. So let's uh, yeah, let's maybe use another color to draw delta t to make it look uh, a little bit easier. So let's say here is our delta t. Right? And uh, we have zero everywhere else. Okay, good. And now let's draw its frequency domain signal. Okay, now, unlike the case of the forest series, where the in the frequency domain, CK is discrete, right? But now we know that in the frequency domain, x omega is a continuous function of the frequency omega now, right? And um, if we draw this, so let's mark here uh, as one, then Let's also use a red color to draw that. So it's nothing but a constant of one. Okay. So do you think it makes sense? Right, let's try to understand. So what is the meaning of the frequency, right? So at zero frequency, it means that the signal doesn't change, right? And if we have a higher and higher frequency component, so it means that the frequency signal can change a lot, right? So do you remember the Gibbs phenomenon that we mentioned, right? For the square waveform, so we have a very sudden change, right? So in order to describe those changes, so we need a very high frequency component to do that. However, the, 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 the strings of the high frequency component may not be very large, right? So in this case, so we can see, so at the point zero, so we have an extremely fast jump, right? For the square waveform, the jump is from zero to one, but now the jump is from zero to infinity. It's a super fast jump, right? So in order to describe those jump, this jump in the frequency domain, so what we need is actually, we need all the frequency component. Right, from zero to infinity. So all the frequency component. Okay, and uh, we also need them has the equal strings, right? All of them equals to one, right? And uh, by using that, we can describe this very big jump. Okay, so this is so this is intuitive explanation of what is happening here. Okay, and uh, and by the way, so. Uh, I don't recall whether we mentioned this or not, right? So, in the so, to, so in practice, we only have the physical meaning for the positive frequency, right? So we do not have a physical meaning for the negative frequency. 
all right okay so the negative frequency is a fact of the mass ma of, of mass okay of the mathematics okay very good so this is for this example so now let's take a look at another example okay next example okay let's change the color back so the next example is it's very similar so let's consider xt equals to delta t minus t naught right it's a shifted version of the delta function okay so let's see what is the value of x omega in this case again we're going to use the definition so let's recall this okay so and then let's plug in this so we have delta t minus t naught and e j omega t dt again so we're going to use the sampling property of the delta function right if you don't recall so we can basically do the same thing as before so if we use something multiplied shifted version of delta uh, function right so this guy is nothing but look like this right at t naught we have infinity right if we use any function multiply this guy so what we're going to get is only the point at t naught right there's no any other point and then if we do this integral so we can basically take this constant out and then do this integral right and clearly this guy is one okay and then we can get this guy is like this okay so what's the meaning of that in this case so do you remember the property for the Fourier series, right? So if we shift the signal in one domain, so it will be a phase shift of the signal in the other domain, right? So here basically means that if we shift t minus t naught, if we shift delta in the time domain by t naught, and then in the other domain, in the frequency domain, So what we're going to have is one, right? So before the Fourier transform of delta t is one, we're gonna shift this by in phase, right? By j omega t naught. So that equals to this guy basically, right? Again, so, so this behavior holds for the Fourier transform, right? Which is not surprising because we derive the Fourier transform from the Fourier series, right? So if we, in one domain, we have a shift on the independent variable, and then in the other domain, we're gonna have a phase shift. Okay, very good. So this is our second example. So now let's look at another example. Okay, so normally, you know, for the Fourier transform, so in order to compute it, we either just use the definition or you know we can use the table to see uh, to, to compute it right for example like the table I uploaded so yeah in this page so that is all the Fourier transform pairs right so from now on please feel free to use this pairs to compute the I mean this table to compute the Fourier transform pair okay but now here let's do the exercise so let's compute it by hand the so next example is that we consider x of t equals to e negative alpha ut and here we assume alpha is bigger than zero of course it's less than infinity okay so now let's compute this guy right so you may uh, pause the video and compute it on your own and see whether you get the same answer with me okay so now I think we're familiar enough with the formula. So we just directly plug xt in here. And uh, we have e negative j omega t dt. 
okay and remember here we have a u of t here right so the u of t basically will always define the integral limit right because for u of t so it is the, yeah let's recall the definition of u of t here so that means it's one when t is bigger than or equal to zero and zero otherwise okay so in this case the integral limit will becomes from zero to infinity and we just has uh, uh, so it's not x of t right this should be e negative alpha and uh, we have e negative alpha times e negative j omega t dt right and next step we can combine these two uh, exponential function right to have a complex exponential again where uh, alpha yes here should be alpha t sorry miss a t here dt okay so now let's do this integral right so so it will become negative 1 over uh, alpha plus j omega and e negative alpha plus j omega t and we evaluate this guy at infinity and 0 okay so when we let t uh, goes to infinity here so we can see that because alpha is positive right so alpha is positive this is very important then this guy will become zero, right? And if we plug t equal to zero here, so this guy will become one. So basically we have a negative, and the inside is zero minus what? One, right? And then we have one over alpha plus j omega. Right, so that's the Fourier transform of that. So now we have another uh, very commonly used Fourier transform pair. So if this is a signal in the time domain, then its Fourier transform is nothing but one over alpha plus j omega. Okay, very good. So this is a. Um, uh, so now let's see the last example in this class. Okay, so last example is, so maybe you want to use a new page for that. So this is again a very important example. So we consider x of t, oh, we consider x of t as follows. So for the case of the Fourier series, we consider the we consider the uh, square waveform, okay? So now, let's consider the same thing, but in a case that the signal is not periodic anymore, right? Just consider a square waveform like this, okay? Let's see the value is one, and uh, so we can write, here's A over two, and here is negative a over 2 and we have a 0 here right okay so this is a square waveform and similarly similar to the case of the forest series right when we do the integral so the discontinuous point kind of doesn't matter right it doesn't matter what value here it is right if you do the integral so you no know, the value here doesn't matter it could be 1 it could be 0 it could be whatever but let's be a little bit Precise. Let's just assume that at this continuous point, the value is half, right? And uh, so you can imagine why, right? Because for the Fourier transform, we also have the Dirichlet condition, which is the sufficient condition of the existence for the Fourier series. And for those conditions, right, at the boundary point, we still have this constraint. If we do the inverse transform. So at boundary point, we're just gonna get the average between this, this point and this point, okay? So that's it. that is to make things a little bit precise, more precise. Okay, so now let's compute 
the forest series in this case. So again, so this is a formula that we're going to use. Right, so now let's plug everything in. So the integral limit, now we can do a write from negative a over 2 to a over 2, right? And in this regime, the value of x is 1. And then we just add and multiply e negative j omega t dt. Okay, seems pretty straightforward, right? So now let's see. So in, for this guy, we're going to have e 1 over negative omega, right? And then e negative j omega t. And then we can evaluate this guy at a over 2 and negative a over 2. Okay, so far so simple. And then we could do some simplifications, right? So let's say here's a uh, e to the power of negative j omega a over 2 minus e j omega plus a over a over 2, right? And uh, now we can put this negative sign inside in order to get what? So let's write in this way. I have j omega and uh, e j omega a over 2 minus e negative j omega a over 2. Okay, what's that? Right, when you see this, right, you should reflect immediately that we can do something like this, right? How about we derive a 2j here and then multiply 2j and then multiply 1 over j omega, right? So what is that? Yeah, consider the inverse Euler's formula. So this will give you nothing but sine a omega over 2. Okay, so given this, so what we're going to have is the follows. So we can cancel this uh, j, right? And then what we're going to have is that, so we have a sine a omega over two and uh, divided by omega, right? Let's see whether it's correct. Divided by this omega and then we have a two here right so let's put a 2 downstairs right we divide it by 2 means that you know we multiply this 2 back in the downstairs okay very good so now you can see it's a sine a omega over 2 divided by omega over 2 right how about we make this guy and this guy the same right it means that let's multiply an a here and then we need to multiply an a outside to make sure it's not changing. Okay, great. So actually, so we can define this guy as a new function, right? Which is called a sink function. So sink of t equals two, right? Doesn't matter what variables were we were using here right equals to sine t over t okay and also i think we define this variable this in the table here so sync x equals to sine x over x right that's the definition of the sync function okay yeah maybe let's write x here to make make it consistent x x x okay Given this definition, and we can write this guy as a multiply sync a omega over 2. Okay, very good. So now we have a very important uh, Fourier transform pair, right? So we know that, so by doing this, yeah, let's assume x of t is given by this formula so we know that when xt is a rectangle function okay so we can in so in this case so we can represent so let's use again the definition here 
so we can see that so we can define a rectangle function here right so so a rectangle function a rect basically means that so between this this region so we have a one outside the region we have a zero okay so let's recall that the boundary point doesn't matter right so in this case we can represent so let's remember memorize that so in this case we okay so in let me move it back in this case we can write x of t as a right function right so let's decide the inside here we can see we as uh, let's see for the right function so it's a negative half to half but here is a negative a to a right so it means that we need to have a scaled version here which is what right should be t over a right let's see whether it's correct or not right if a is 2 right so if we div if we multiply something it's less than 1 so it means that we should expand our signal right so and uh, we're going to have negative 1 and 1 here so it seems correct right yes so if we have a right function here then it's for a transform ctft is nothing but a sync function we have a sine sync a omega over 2 right so that is the Fourier transform for this guy okay so we can also double check it uh, by using the table here right so if we go down so we can actually check see all the Fourier transform pairs and here so this is a rect function if rect t, t uh, small t over capital t so that equals to this guy t omega t over 2 right and if we replace this capital t by a in our case you can see they're identical right it means that we're correct okay okay very good so now let's take a look at the meaning of it right so let's draw again about this two signal let's say x of t yeah for simplicity we just draw like that right doesn't matter for the boundary point when we compute the forward transform okay and then it's forward transform ctft give us something like this okay let's see how can we draw a sync function okay x omega so that is a sync function so for the sync function so definition is sine x over x right so when x is zero right it's like sine zero zero x is zero we need to use the L'Hopital's rule to compute that means that we need to take the derivative of the uh, numerator and take the derivative of the denominator and then let x goes to zero and then compute the limit right if you compute that you can see so basically that guy will become one right since now we have a scaling factor a so at point zero we have an a okay and then you know as long uh, you know as x becomes large so the sine function will be the magnitude of the sign will become smaller and smaller right but the important point where the sign becomes zero doesn't change right because x is never be zero anymore right so let's so basically it will look like you know still look like a sign function but the magnitude will keep decreasing right more or less it will look like this right it will look like this but magnitude will keep decreasing right so that's the shape of the sync function and the important thing are all these cross points right so we need to work that out right so what's the value of the first point 
right? The first point is for the sine, if we consider it sine x, so the first zero point would be what? Pi, right? So if we do, if we use that, and then we can get the corresponding omega equals to what? Should be pi over a over two should be two pi over a, right? That's the first point. And this point is what? So for the sine, it should be two pi, right? So that should be four pi over a, right? Similarly, so this guy is negative two pi over a, and uh, this guy is four pi over a, right? And that's uh, that's the sine function, okay? So. Uh, so from this, so there's a very important, uh, there, there's a very important uh, observation here, right? So if we look at the signal, so we can see x of t is finite in the time domain. So which means that, so we have boundary point, right? After this point is all zero, and after this point is all zero. Okay, however in the frequency domain is not finite anymore right so this will keep forever right although the magnitude will become smaller and smaller but it will keep forever right again so this basically means that you know we can see this jump right it's like very high frequency right it's a very sudden jump from zero until t1 right so in order to describe this sudden jump so we need basically all the frequency component to describe it uh, correctly. So otherwise, we're gonna have the Gibbs phenomenon, okay? But, you know, this jump is not that huge, right? Just from zero to one. It's not from zero to infinity. Therefore, you know, for the higher frequency component, so, you know, the strength decreases as the frequency uh, becomes higher and higher, right? So actually, we can generalize this behavior what, which means that if in the time domain or in the frequency domain, right? So we have a signal that's finite and then in the other domain, it's infinite, right? So it means that, so if let's say if a signal in one domain is finite, I mean the range is finite, right? So in the other domain, I mean the a range, of the signal is finite in one domain then in the other domain the range of the signal is infinite so it's like this so the range of the signal is finite in one domain, it could be time, it could be frequency, and then we can say the range of the signal is infinite in the other domain. Okay, however, vice versa is not true. So we can now go in this direction. So can you give me a counter example? Right, so actually we see that so one very good counterexample would be our example three, right? We can see, so both of them has infinite range, right? So this function has a value for all t, right? So for t it's less than zero, it's zero, but you know, it's also have infinite range, right? The range will go on forever. And also this guy will has value, non-zero value for all omega, okay? Yeah, all right, so this is, uh, almost everything we want to, dis uh, want to cover for today. And uh, so uh, in the end, I would like to emphasize again that so this signal is very, very important, right? That is one of the most important signal we use in practice, right? Because, you know, for the digital communication, this square waveform is very, very important, right? And then later on, we may mention a little bit that so, so this is the fundamentals 
of a very important communication com uh, technology, so which is called OFDM, orthogonal frequency uh, division multiplexing. Okay, so that is the fundamental of OFDM, right? This is very, very important. So square and a sync function is always a pair. Let's just remember this, okay? Alrighty, okay, that's all for today. So uh, please let me know if you have any questions or comments and uh, please stay safe and uh, healthy. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.